It's the Yukon Podcast. I'm Professor Stephen Dyson. And I'm Professor Jeff Dudas. And Jeff, we're here today to talk about the latest Richard Linklater movie, Hitman. Is the pie good? All pie is good pie, yeah. is the line that is used by the protagonist of Hitman, uh, Gary Johnson, yeah. who was a, a real character, and we'll get into this, you know, the Hitman is based on a real story. And this was his, um, I don't know what the technical term for it is, but it's like his password when he meets someone for the first time, a client of his. This is how they identify one another. Exactly. They, yes. And, uh, you know, it's, is the pie good? All pie is good pie. Mm -hmm. um, Hitman, a movie that's been out in cinemas for, I guess, like a couple of weeks and then just came out on Netflix on Friday, we both watched it yeah. over the weekend. It's getting extraordinarily good reviews. It seems to be very popular. Yeah, it's, it's getting good reviews. I suppose we should we should start with a sort of temperature check. I mean, yeah. what did you what did you make of the movie? I mean, I thought it was very entertaining. You know, I was we were talking off camera within the first couple of minutes. You feel like you're kind of hooked in and ready to go. I agree, and it's a, it's an easy watch, which is not to say that it's that we think it's necessarily an insubstantial mm -hmm. movie, but it's it's not kind of super challenging or or super difficult to sort of understand what's going on or to uh, identify with the characters or at least find a right. find a way into the characters. So sometimes maybe slightly to the movie's detriment. I mean, some a couple of the characters are a little one dimensional or right. or underdrawn, but in general they're appealing, attractive people right. involved in um, you know a, a caper. Uh, you know, or a variety of, of mm -hmm. capers um, that, 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 are, that are quite dark on, on their face, but are often sort of played for laughs. Right. And as with all Linklater movies, the dialogue is really the strength of the movie. It's clear that this is, um, this is a director who takes great care in crafting dialogue that feels pretty authentic and feels pretty lived in. Right. Which is not always, you know, when you get a highly disquisitional sort of text like the ones that Linklater produces, sometimes they feel they don't feel like authentic conversations that you might overhear if you were sitting in the booth next next to these people. And I I do think that that's a, a kind of a constant and a through line with his movies is that the dialogue feels genuine. Yeah, and the I mean for Linklater fans, there's a there are obvious parallels to be drawn between Gary and Maddie, the protagonists of Hitman. And Jesse and Celine, the protagonists of, of Boyhood, you know, both right. sides are kind of hyper literate. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, both, both movies fe feature hyper literate couples who really enjoy kind of playing off each other and have obvious uh, chemistry. I mean, maybe the Ga Gary and Maddie's chemistry is more instantly, well, I don't know if this is reasonable to say, is more instantly physical and, and more instantly kind of transported mm. into that. Th that register of, of interaction, but they, they did seem sort of parallel couples. Right, right. And there are lots of, as we'll talk about, there are lots of through lines with his his kind of heroic characters as well. There's a, as we might talk about later, I think there's, there's a relatively short line between Gary Johnson and Pink from Dazed and Confused. Yeah, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, also a really interesting acting performance from mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Powell, the the central character, yeah. who managed to manages to sort of embody within within one body uh, two sort of almost polar opposite yeah. um, archetypes, the sort of the dweeby, uh, somewhat pathetic, uh, slightly sort of emasculated mm -hmm. kind of college professor. And then there's the kind of hyper sexy, hyper physical man of action. As I said, Glenn, Glenn Powell does that within one body, whereas in our dynamic, it takes two of us to hit those polarities. <laughs> and so, Gary, I mean, we're, Jeff. We're going to leave the viewers to decide which is which. I think it's evident. <laughs> and it's in, 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 entirely clear. Yeah. Um, so good. So we should, we have a three-part framework yeah. with, which we, <laughs> with which we attack uh, works about, destroy works of popular culture sometime. Although I don't think that's the case no. this time. We this elevate isn't a, them. We elevate them. This is an appreciation, I think, of what we do think is a, uh, you know, a, a good and interesting mm -hmm. movie. I don't think it's linked as finest or really try to be linked right. as finest, but it's it's very interesting. We have a three-part framework with which we consider these um, these texts. The first uh, part of the framework is we call it on the surface or textual or sort of authorial intention. We look at what Linklater, and in this case, Glenn Powell, who yeah. co-wrote the screenplay, um, were trying to say with the movie what sort of explicit references they make mm. and what sort of, uh, you know, fairly obvious um, intertextual connotations they draw. You know, what are the works of popular culture or other uh, other texts are they referring yeah. to and what does that tell us? Um, we then move on to a section that we variously call sort of mythologies or ideologies or audience uh, understandings. Do you want to tell Cultural us? Cultural themes, the sorts of, the sorts of background frequently unexpected and unintentional sorts of 
un frameworks of understanding that an audience would tend to bring with it as it was watching or engaging the text. And here we step typically outside of the realm of the author's intention and into the realm of audience reception and how an audience might plausibly make sense given its cultural reference and its mythological re reference, how an audience might plausibly make sense of the text. Yeah. Or, I mean, another way to say that is the, um, you know, the, the, the first... The first level is sort of what's encoded into the text mm -hmm. by the author, and the second is what audiences might sure. decode mm -hmm. in that classic of encoding, decoding yeah. model of popular culture. Uh, and then we move on to a third section, which we call uh, critique, mm -hmm. in which we examine the text for what it might be saying about the, you know, the, the nature of uh, the taken for granted in our reality, how it might mm -hmm. problematize that, how it might offer alternate modes of being and modes of, mm -hmm. of living. And, and very interestingly, you know, that always sounds kind of highfalutin, but right. we always manage to find <laughs> some way in which a work of popular culture is either critiquing, uh, cr critiquing often mythologies of society, you know, level three critiquing level two or, or offering mm -hmm. some alternative, or, or sometimes we end up talking about what critics um, yes. have said about the text and do we agree or disagree with, with the reception that it's getting. Yes. Okay, so we should dive into it. Let's go. And we'll be right back with our first section on the surface. And we are back with our uh, first cut into Hitman, today's text. And this is the on the surface um, element where we talk about what the author was trying to say, yeah. even including some elements of, of plot and some very explicit, you know, as I say, on the surface elements of the text. Interestingly, Jeff, the movie Hitman is based on an article in uh, the Texas Monthly, mm -hmm magazine, uh, um, you know, which is obviously tells Texas stories, but actually quite often has national yes. sort of impact. I remember the political reporter Robert Draper wrote a lot of stories, I'm sure for Texas Monthly around the George W. Bush time that, yeah. that had national impact. And I mean, anyway, that's a, uh, an aside. This article in Texas Monthly, I think back in 2000, 2001, 2001, okay, by Skip Hollinsworth, mm -hmm. um, who Richard Linklater says is a friend of his, okay. was about Gary Johnson, mm -hmm. who is in fact a real figure, not just the name of the protagonist in Hitman, um, he was in fact uh, someone who taught college yeah. classes. He kind of adjuncted at a, mm -hmm. a community college. And he also uh, sort of surprisingly worked as a staff investigator for the Harris County District Attorney's right. Office. But unlike our fictional Gary Johnson, the real Gary Johnson had some significant background in law enforcement mm -hmm. prior to the, becoming this kind of um, consultant, I suppose, for the Houston Police Department. Yeah, and, and what he'd do, um, but both in the fictional and the, and the real version, is he, he, he found himself um, asked by the police to pose as a, a fictional hitman, yeah. you know, to meet with um, people who were looking to settle a um, financial dispute or a kind of pers interpersonal beef or those, it says in the movie, like those, those two were, always on, were almost always intertwined. Yeah. And they would kind of ask around, usually through some sort of intermediary, someone yeah. who they thought might have connections, you know, an ex-con or I think at one stage a, a, a woman who works in a, in a strip club. Right. Um, you know, do you know anyone who can help me off my mm -hmm. <laughs> partner, wife, whoever else? Rival, whoever. Yeah, and then that, that person would, you know, be somewhat alarmed and would call the police and the police would say, Gary, you're up, go and, go and yeah. pose as this hitman and meet with this person. Right. And the, the goal of the meeting was, um, of course, not to facilitate <laughs> the actual crime, but was to get the the person who's looking to solicit a murder yeah. to do so uh, on tape. You know, Gary would wear a wire and would say, so what is it you want me to do here? And and would lead them uh, to to say, well, I actually want you to kill this person. And he, he is also some recompense for, for doing so. Yeah, right. And what the article does a really good job of doing that also surfaces in the movie is that the real Gary Johnson quotes is quoted as saying, you know, what I'm really doing is I'm engaged in the process of facilitating communication. I'm trying to get people to confess to me their desires, right? Their deepest desires. I'm trying to make a connection in that way. That's the job. And so like the fictional Gary Johnson, he would play different roles, take on different personas. Um, clearly, this is somebody who has a great talent for being able to intuit very quickly what kind of person would be the most likely to facilitate this sort of communication. And we see that played out, you know, maybe five, six, seven times in different little vignettes in Hitman, where the fictional Gary Johnson is doing the exact same thing. And in fact, the fictional Gary Johnson is shown as doing a bunch of research and looking up people's social media profiles and trying to kind of figure out what sort of character would be 
the best one to facilitate Who's your hitman? This. Who's your hitman? Jeff, who who is your hitman? Who, what would you what what kind of archetype? I mean, I know I've put you on the spot here. Jeff, were you about to engage in the, the commissioning of a of a capital mm. crime? Um, <laughs> what is the type of person you're I, hoping to to meet to do this? I can genuinely say I've never thought about this before. I haven't either. Uh, I, wonder who it would I be. don't know. I I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I would have to think about it. Yeah, it's a difficult one. But isn't it's it? I mean, we've got Indiana Jones on the the, the thing it, behind us. You know, yeah, I don't think of. He's not really a hitman. Uh, B. A. Baracus. No. Ronald Reagan. I'm just speaking well, people. Well, manner of speaking. <laughs> uh, what's his name? Which whichever m mutant ninja. It's one of the turtles. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know who my hitman would be. Um, I, I. It's something that's. It's not worth pondering, but it would take some pondering, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, perhaps more interesting, and this would get to one of the movie's obvious themes, like it's very much on the surface, is, you know, the the, the nature of identity and personality yeah. and do you know yourself? And I wonder if instead of these kind of um, questions they ask you, you know, would you rather be a coal miner or a florist or all the rest of it? Maybe, uh, you know, or the, or the Myers-Briggs personality mm -hmm. inventory um, questions. Maybe that's actually a killer, maybe pun intended, <laughs> question to get to the core of, of personality. Who would your hitman be? Who would you confess to? Yeah, right. who, who would you find credible right. and um, capable and, you know, right. something you, know, you could trust with this and, text? And it struck me as I was, as we've been talking and as I was thinking a little bit more about the movie, as you noted, it, it very much is meant to be the duality of a hitman and a college professor, as though these things are remarkably different kinds. Whereas we know they're very similar. <laughs> well, on the surface, they're clearly dissimilar. Right. But I think there's a deeper and more interesting tether, which is that, as, as you know, what we do as professors is we... Our goal is to facilitate communication. True. Our goal is to try to help students of of a whole variety of different backgrounds, learning styles, approaches, levels of interest, mm -hmm. trying to get them to engage their creative imaginations and their intellectual faculties in such a way that they can reach something, confess something about the material or about their lives in a way that they can understand the material in relation to their lives in a way that is maybe not dissimilar from what Gary Johnson imagines himself as doing in that yes. interpersonal situation. So maybe the maybe it, it's exactly right that he's a college professor. Yeah. Because that is what he's doing. He's standing in front of an audience trying to figure out which role, which persona is going to be the one to most effectively draw That's a out. Point. Yeah a whole variety of different types of people and learning styles. And it is performance. Like every time you step in front of a class, you're not, you're giving an element of yourself or you're maybe playing up an element of your personality, but it's not at all it's the way like, that you would interact in any human in a normal right. set of Right, and it's not the whole of one's personality no. either. It's it's amplifying certain traits and it's suppressing others, which is exactly what Gary Johnson is doing right. as well. Right, right. Right. Although there are some uh, tropes that, you know, any, any it's, it's like anytime you see your profession portrayed on screen, like you, you notice all the little things that you're like, yeah, that would not happen in a million years or, all, you know, and the, the, there are some consistent ones in movie portrayals. Do you of, not leave your students at the end of the semester prior to the taking of the final exam with the kinds of inspirational words <laughs> I know, I know. that Gary leaves his students with? You know, I find I'm in the service business to, <laughs> to quote the movie and I find that they're not a hundred percent interested in my my life philosophies at that particular it's point in my college moment. journey. Yeah. You know, they're more like, can you tell us exactly what's on the test, mm -hmm. and and can we negotiate that? Uh, you know, yeah. And also the other thing that there are a couple other things that that I think always come up in movies about, uh, you know, that that portray college classes. And are never ever true. One is, of course, the the college professor is always played by like a Hollywood superstar. So he's in like a one physical shape. He's in the top zero point one percent of Speak for yourself <laughs> physical attractiveness, and is this amazing, commanding sort of performative figure. The second one I always think is funny about any portrayal of psychology by people who are not psychologists is the assumption that what it actually is is sort of. Um, uh, sort of mind reading <laughs> and the, the, the knowledge of psychology gives you it's it's like it, it gives you a perfect ability to manipulate people yeah. to instantly look at them and say ah you're a yeah. this is your archetype this is how I push your buttons and the words actually conf converse right. none of those abilities and I don't want to get in trouble with psychology 
colleagues, but but there are serious questions as to what is actually reliably known about any element right. of Although psychology. One, one thing that is potentially interesting um, is that the, this is also the therapist's job, right? The therapist's job is to get the client talking yeah. and, well, and this, get the this client like, to frame their life experience right. in a way that is revelatory even to them. Yeah. But there's that always there's that conflation of psychology with uh, psychiatry all the yeah. all the time psychoanalysis all, yeah. all the time that conflation is there. Right. The other thing I always find very funny is you know I read um, reviews of the movie and they'd say um, you know he's he's uh, he's a professor and he's really struggling because his students are like the least engaged people you ever see. I watched those classes; those were amazingly engaged. Like they're all there. They're, none of them are on the laptops. They're all listening to what he says. He asks the question and they, they all they put their hands up or the multiple you know, people to answer. This, or this, to answer. This, this would be a <laughs> this is really a, a top level um, uh, result that he's been able to achieve. That, that I, as a less talented professor, I'm not always able to achieve. It's a dream scenario of only which some of us. <laughs> can in fact aspire yes yeah exactly yeah. exactly so um so there's that um what else are we going to talk about in terms of the the, the text i think maybe some of the intertextual sure. reference that are in there so one of the big points this texas monthly article makes which is then recycled as a pretty important plot point in hitman as well is that this type of hitman for hire doesn't actually really exist right. in the world there are like, you know, hitmen for organized crime, yeah. right? Um, but the idea that you can kind of go out and hire somebody to do this sort of work is almost entirely a pop culture fiction. Yeah. It's a, a Hollywood fiction in particular. And I think Linklater is pretty interesting and astute technically by when he's got those montages in which he's interspersing the – you know, different famous iconic movies that portray Hitman. Then there's, you know, one of the things that's very obvious is that um, he has he has um, Gary Johnson dress up uh, as famous fictional Hitman. Yeah, right? yeah. And so the American Psycho trust. guy is is clearly in there. Yeah. Um, like the was a Russian guy supposed to be like a Bond villain? Or was from that 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 from a different? So. I, the thing text. that I've seen most recently, I mean, it's reminiscent of the of the serial killer from the most recent season of Fargo, but I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a reference to a different fictional character. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they've got like the scar or yeah, the you know the, right. the facial tick or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, lots of kind of neo noir movies. Mm -hmm. uh, a reference there. I, I know you we we talked fun. You hadn't quite seen this, but it, but I talked about Michael Mann's Collateral and yeah. Tom Cruise's character. And, uh, but as I explained to you, the character in Collateral is is just an archetypal hitman. And we're going to come back to this, I yeah. think, in, in mythology. But it's also, it's a rom-com. Yeah. Right. It's got all of the elements of the rom-com. It's got the meat cute. Yeah. It's got the sort of torrid physical and emotional connection that goes on for the second act. Mm. Then it's got the reveal that, you know, something is amiss, right? The characters are... Or at least one of the characters is not what he seems or he or she seems to be. In this case, it's what he seems to be. And then there's the reconciliation. Yes. Right. So the, it's got all of the classic elements of the rom-com in addition to these sort of other kind of neo-noir elements and more straightforwardly comedic elements. Yeah. I thought um, Breaking Bad was in there. Mm. You know, the notion of the, the teacher who is dweeby and down on his look and then then becomes... Um, not only turns to a sort of criminal or criminal adjacent type enterprise, but but in that process becomes a much more like self-confident, assertive figure. Well, and the other character that's exactly like that is someone you already referenced, Indiana Jones. Yeah. Right. Who is always portrayed as a harried kind of very uncharismatic archaeology professor. Yeah. But as soon as he steps out of the classroom, he becomes this swashbuckling, heroic figure engaged in pretty dubious ethical behavior, perhaps not illegal, he does kill people. Yes. Um, so there is this kind of, you're right. I mean, there are all these little references um, that are embedded within the text, some of which are clear and obvious, many of which are not. There's that great article, and I forget, that I'm blocking on what magazine it was in, <laughs> but I'm sure you can find it on the internet. But there's that, that great spoof article, um, uh, Professor Indiana Jones's Tenure Review. <laughs> Is that Professor Sweeney's? I mean, yes, that's yeah. it exactly. For Professor Jones, we've noticed we've noticed several absences from campus. <laughs> <laughs> well, your field work has great yeah. inherent interest. You know, blah blah blah. You get the general idea. Um, um, the other thing that I think we should talk about in this section quickly is the intertextual references to Linklater's previous movies. Okay, and to his oeuvre. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, as we'll talk about a lot, I think, in the next section, mm -hmm. um, this is a story about identity, self-consciously a story about identity, the capacity to be able to shape and to choose identities um, that you are either more interested in or that better suit you or that feel more authentic for whatever your lived experience is. And that is a very much a constant theme. Right. In Linklater's movies and they go back what I had mentioned earlier, I think that the one clear analog in Linklater's catalog to the Gary Johnson character is the pink Floyd character from Dazed and Confused, in which you've got this character who seems to be trapped within a pretty obvious, well defined identity. For Pink, it's the high school quarterback of the, you know, of the high powered Texas football scene. And it's a, an identity that he's uncomfortable with or at least ambivalent about. And he wants to explore, step out of this role. And it's exactly that which makes him the heroic character. Yeah. Right. As opposed to in, like, in Dazed and Confused, the Ben Affleck character who is so arrested in his moments of immaturity and sadism that he, he self-sabotages so that he can stay in high school for longer to repeat the same rituals over and over again. And so there's, there's something about the Gary Johnson character that is very evocative of those early Linklater um, meditations on identity and the capacity to shape um, one's identity, to pick and choose different roles and different types of personality and maybe the limits of, of that capacity to do that. Yeah. 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 And I think that's something we're going to come back to because yeah. the, you know, the notion of identity and its malleability and its re relationship to the environment and all the rest of it might, might actually be something we could touch on in mm -hmm. critique. Yeah. Um, Okay, anything else you want to say on this in this first section or should we uh, should we move on? We are ready for myth. Okay, so we will be right back with our second section mythologies. And we are back with our second cut on today's text, the Richard Linklater movie Hitman. We are moving now Jeff to the the level of myth yes. and what are some uh, uh, popular kind of uh, collective cultural structures that people might bring to the movie that would help them understand the movie. I think this section sort of writes itself in this in in the case of this movie and it's it's almost so on your head over the head with it so much you almost wonder if this shouldn't be in the on the surface section but it is myth and that's the myth that's the myth of the hitman mm. the hitman is we are told in both the texas monthly article and then explicitly on screen it is a popular culture figure who migrates you know didn't migrate from the real world into popular culture but is in fact created by the popular culture and has migrated into the real world and all of these people in the in the Texas Monthly article, the real people and then their fictionalized representations on screen have seen movies, uh, you know, and TV shows with hitmen and have therefore assumed that the hitman exists and it's become a mytho mythological figure. But as Gary Johnson, the real Gary Johnson, uh, uh, tells us in the Texas Monthly article, you know, that there are no real hitman and Skip Hollinsworth writes, although the professional hitman is a staple of detective fiction, no one is really certain if there is anyone in this country who makes a living as a hired gun. Mm. Nevertheless, the myth remains intact among a certain subject of Houstonians uh, that if they just hunt hard enough, they will find that special someone willing to murder a complete stranger in cold blood. And of course, there is a total mismatch between what would happen to you, I mean, especially in Texas, <laughs> mm. what would happen to you as, you know, as a serial murderer uh, for, you know, in, in what is obviously not a crime of passion, but a premeditated you know, but slightly and economically motivated killing, mm. uh, you know, what what would that be worth to you? You'd certainly get the death penalty. I mean, who is who is going to take that that deal? Almost no one. But yet the myth persists that they must exist and it persists because of popular culture. There's a way in which the premise of this story is a perfect case study for what we're doing in this podcast as right. a whole. The, the notion that... One of the things that is so important about the stories that we use to entertain ourselves or to help ourselves make sense of what our communities are like or what our lived experiences are like, that one of the most important elements is that those stories shape how we live. They shape how we feel. They shape how we behave. They shape how we imagine what might be possible or impossible. This is exactly that theme. Yeah. Exactly that theme. There's no evidence, as far as we can tell, that the hired for gun the gun for hire hitman really exists, but it, the imagery persists. And it's not just, it doesn't just persist in this kind of contract killing element. I mean, when you think about it, this is in many ways the one of the defining feature of the Western 
as a genre as well as a storytelling genre, right? The gun for hire, the the mercenary, the person who you call in. You know, this is Kurosawa's theme from Seven Samurai. It's, it's repeated in um, The Magnificent Seven, right? It's all of the all of those spaghetti westerns that Clint Eastwood is a part of, a great many of the John Wayne movies, it's the hired gun who's brought in to help a community take care of a problem. And there's no evidence that that was an, a real figure in the Old West, just as there's no evidence that it's a real figure now, but it's got this deep and layered tradition in our storytelling that really collapses the distinction between fantasy and reality in the same way that all of these distinctions between fantasy and reality are collapsed in so many of the texts that we have spent time talking about. Yeah, yeah. And as, as you were speaking, the um, a, another referent that occurred to me was, have you ever seen the Ryan Gosling movie Drive? Long ago. Yeah, so so this, this I think, also embodies that myth, and it's maybe where, you, you know, another source of this kind of... Uh, Ryan Gosling's character is not a, not a hitman, but he's a, the getaway driver. You know, the, the professional who comes in to do the specific mm -hmm. task. And, you know, that these people are, are often embody a, 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 the same set of qualities, right? Like the loner, the person who the whole thing in drive is, has, has no commitments, can leave on a moment's yeah. notice. The, the actual, the, the sort of really risky thing in this mythology is, is generating commitments because that's when you're likely to get caught. And of course, in a sense, this is what happens in, in Hitman, that, you know, Gary, Gary's life is made more complicated because he actually genuinely falls for yeah. Maddie. And in a sense, this, this goes back to a, to other maybe darker myths, such as the, you know, the, 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 the run through American fiction, like how, how do American males get in trouble? They, they get in trouble because they become entangled with women. There's so, a femme fatale. Yeah, um, exactly. For sure. In that Linklater is playing with here, although he leaves it this is one of the interesting things, or maybe from a different point of view, frustrating things about the character development here is that it very much seems like the Madison character is going to be a femme fatale. She seems to be running a side game. It seems almost clear yeah. from the first moment that we meet her that she's running a side game. She's not who she seems to be, that the story is significantly more complicated. And there are hints, I think, throughout, particularly in the portrayal of the husband, that the story here is not exactly how Madison is portraying it to Ron, yeah. a.k.a. Gary. But she's never really fully embraced in the femme fatale mystique. Yeah. Um, and but you but you're certainly correct in the in the broader scope that this archetype is always portrayed as a loner. I mean, think about those Clint Eastwood movies that I was talking about. He's not even given a name. It's the, literally the man with no name. Yeah. Precisely because the idea is that you, you need to ensure that the individuality or the personality of the person is so tamped down and depressed that it never becomes a potential problem. Yeah, and the, and the hitman is, is it, in, in many, many representations, like this very precise, mm -hmm. you know, self-contained uh, uh, figure who's in re really professionalism and precision mm -hmm. um, is is the core thing. Which is now, now I think about it, the, uh, the 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 sort of cartoonish elements of some of the hit men that Gary Johnson portrays. You know, I think there's there's there's, there's an obvious reason why Ron, who's mm -hmm. the precise, self-contained, you know, very charismatic, but but also you know the the man of clear boundaries and the, and the person who doesn't draw a lot of attention to himself with his opinion. You know, he's very smooth and very attractive, but he's not this kind of cartoon, yeah. cartoon Russian with the ridiculous accent or wearing the silly disguise. He's, he's the kind of character that, that is not only the right one for Maddie, but is, the, mm -hmm. but is the central one that propels the movie and that we spend most time with, because he's the one who fits the, the, the mythology of the, of, the, of, the, of the hitman. He fits the mythology of the hitman. And it struck me as you were talking, I mean, there's been another very recent portrayal of uh, a hitman type figure, a, a killer for hire in American popular culture. And I'm thinking of the Killing Eve yes. as, with Villanelle. Yeah. And what's interesting there, right, there's a gender component that flips the the typical archetype on its head. But she is, she's always portrayed, she's always wearing costumes. She's always, you know, trying on some slightly different identity in order to do the job. And so e even there in a, in a show that is self-consciously looking to subvert the genre expectations, 
it's still relying upon this kind of uh, person from nowhere, right? Person with no name, the, the kind of chameleon-like ability to inhabit different identities and different personalities in order to appeal to different different clients yeah. or in Vanell's case, different victims. Yeah. The, a, a related mythology that occurred to me, and I don't, I don't know if you saw the same thing or you think it was present, was the the linkage between kind of sex and killing mm. and that the hitman is is not just a precise figure but it, but is also a um you know a deeply attractive figure and the, the kind of assumption that's that's tied up in this which is counterintuitive when you think about it because you think if you if you meet someone who kills other human beings mm. is that really going to be hot i'm not sure i would find that hot but but certainly in portrayals of hitman on screen mm. and in the story of of ron and maddie you know, he's he's when he's Gary, he's he's not sexually attractive at all, and he's he kind of has this ex partner who who had critiqued him for being too kind of uh, uh, pensive when when having sex and, and all mm -hmm. the rest of it. As soon as he becomes Ron, everyone wants to have sex with him, including like his colleagues, his colleagues at the workplace yeah. and his students, mm -hmm. and and obviously Maddie, you know, finds him this incredibly sort of hot figure. Yeah. And that, that seems to be a mythology maybe more than naturality. I, I don't know, not having, you know, met, met many hit I, It seems to rely upon that, this, that kind of element of danger. Right? Yeah. The notion of the danger and mysteries yeah. frequently people sometimes find exciting. Right. right? Um, and then it's kind of transmogrified into exciting is understood as, you know, registering in the, the domain of sexual desire. Yeah, but like women like bad boys yeah. seems to be the thing that's... So, so now, and, now and, and also, I mean, should just say to throw back to Vill Killing Eve, it's the same thing in Killing Eve, yeah. right? That it's Villanelle is this extremely sexually attractive character yeah. precisely because of that element yeah. of danger and mystery. Yeah. I mean, now we're in this territory and I, 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 don't, know what, I don't know what you're going to think of this, but the one mythology we often talk about are kind of gender roles and gender stereotypes, and we've hit on some of them, but I wonder if we need to, to kind of sharpen this up a little bit. Gary slash Ron ends up with, it's something of a male fantasy, his, his kind of mm. cycle through various types of, of maleness. You know, there's the, there's the, the kind of intellectual who's is sort of underwhelming and a bit, a bit physically pathetic and, and all those men are in, in this, if, if we take the movie's mythological scheme on its face, all these men are sort of dissatisfied and, and want to be more thrusting alpha males mm -hmm. and he gets to do that. He becomes Ron and then he's a real bad boy and he lives wildly and, you know, that's great. And then at the end, he's like, well, I found the right blend of Ron and Gary and he's rewarded with another male fantasy, which is the... Um, D domestic mm -hmm. life that's, that's sort of perfectly combines family man yeah that, but sort of perfectly, perfectly combines the, the the family man with the unbelievably hot mm. <laughs> you know w wife who's who's also excellent domestically and and you know whereas and then i wonder for, for, does does maddie get sort of short changed here a little mm. bit because we meet her as um you know the the, the hyper vulnerable person in need of rescue by the man she then cycles very quickly, and tell me, I mean, I'm just putting this out there, tell me if you think this is way off, way off base. Um, she then cycles into the, the hypersexualized femme fatale, you know, and then she's, you know, d d a, d a domestic support for Gary slash Ron's male fantasy. Is that, is that too harsh or is, and, 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 throughout, and throughout she's an object of suspicion. You just can't yeah. help the feeling that, She's playing someone, even though it's never quite paid off. Yeah. The movie leads us to think that she's highly deceptive at, at various points. And in the exact moment when you imagine as an audience member that the femme fatale routine is about to come to fruition, right? The femme fatale never does the deed themselves. No. They, they manipulate the, the mark. Right. essentially into doing it for them. Right. At that moment, she does, in fact, do the deed herself multiple times. Yes. And so... One of my dissatisfactions, actually, with the movie is the lack of character development mm -hmm. uh, from Madison in particular. Mm -hmm. And I would say there's some, there's a whiff of a lack of character development in the Jasper character as well. Yeah. But I agree. I mean, I think it's unmistakably the case that we are supposed to see her as an object of suspicion from the beginning, as we talked about earlier. And yet there's very little that ever kind of comes to fruition about her. The movie kind of shortchanges her character development in the service 
of of allowing Gary to do, as you say, to run through the the full uh, catalog of male fantasies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, do you think we hit the? I mean, we were going to talk about the, the American notion of the confidence man. Do you mm-hmm. think we hit that sort of hard enough, or is there some other other things you wanted to? I mean, I I think it's worth say. thinking a bit through. Okay. A bit more about this sort of the notion of the confidence man. I mean, what Gary is doing in his persona as a fake hitman is that he is a confidence man, as yep. we talked about earlier. He's his goal is to his charge is to as quickly as possible determine the deepest and darkest desires of his marks. Right. And they're they're literally marks here, right? He's trying to put them in jail. Right. He's trying to get them to confess. And so he's offering up what they most desire and he's trying to facilitate that in the in the classic way of the of the American confidence man in particular. But there's also a notion underneath the surface of the the confidence man as a a kind of iconic American character, as someone who comes from obscure or somehow dissatisfactory origins that are somehow um, holding them back or that somehow are restricting their true potential and capacity, and that there's something about American life that invests them at least with the desire to go out and remake themselves, yeah. to turn themselves into the sort of character that, you know, when Gary turns himself into Ron, what is he doing if not retreading the fictional ground first marked out by Jay Gatsby when he turns himself from Jay Gats into, into Gatsby? Um, or how how is this that different than the the ways in which some of the, you know, the sort of classic Mark Twain novels that yeah, yeah. portray the development of the of the American confidence man. Well, and I'm much less literate than you. So the example I was thinking of was Don Draper in, yeah. in Mad Men. Yeah. You know, who goes through a similar, yeah. uh, you know, he's Dick Whitman and he's kind of nondescript. Mm-hmm. And uh, even when he starts working in advertising, he's he's sort of pretty bumbling and nervous mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. And over time, he embodies the yeah. the, the Don Draper and self-made there's, there's something about man. that self-making, which we are led to believe invests these characters and these personalities with the sort of very keen capability that that Gary has this ability to very quickly determine and define and divine or to intuit what it is that the mark wants most and then an a, a malleability of personality and approach that allows them to present themselves as that thing right that yeah. will evoke or evince the deepest desire. Yes. Okay. So, so in that way, I mean, Hitman is strikes me as being pretty solidly within an American tradition of storytelling. Uh, that is, you know, it's not just the Hitman tradition. It's not just playing with the femme fatale or the neo noir. It's not just playing with a rom com. It's not just genre. It's within a larger cultural tradition of self making, remaking the both the the potential and the Sinister elements, yeah, of that self-making. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, um, I think we've. I think that's good for myth. Yeah, and we should um, knock that one on the head, and we will be right back with. Uh, is that not a phrase you use in American? Knock it on the head. I thought it meant something different in Britain. We're we're going to talk off camera <laughs> about what Jeff thinks <laughs> the phrase "knock it on the head" yeah. means, but it means sack it off, which is another British phrase for. Um, the, the, this particular thing we're referring to is finished. That particular thing is section That's two. That's what I thought. So we're going well. to have an off-camera discussion about uh, British cultural idiom, and we'll be right back with our third section on critique. And we are back with our third and final section of today's discussion of the movie Hitman. This section is called uh, critique. We should dive straight into that. I think one category we wanted to talk about that the movie plays with that's maybe subversive or, or or makes you think you know more deeply about received uh, reality and received ways of doing things is the movie's commentary on just how malleable yeah. identity is and and what it means to have or maybe not to have a car or to have several cars um what were you what did you make of that yeah I mean, you're right it is on the surface in a certain way there are multiple conversations um amongst the characters about this kind of shape-shifting capability um, and about the promise and the limitations of it. It's also, it also points to, as we were talking about earlier, characteristic, maybe the characteristic theme of Linklater's career, which is the breakdown between fantasy and reality. Yeah. The way in which 
people live and, and we work ourselves through lived experience with a kind of dim awareness of the real and, and the fake. And that the, the shape-shifting of identities, the chameleon-like capabilities of a character like Gary Johnson sort of illustrate this malleability between the real and, and the fictional, I suppose, in a, in a very clear and heightened way, right? That he is a kind of a savant, right, of, of shape-shifting. Um, this is, we see this over and over again in Linklater's. We were talking about his, his very early movie, Slacker. And Slacker is, is a case study in all of these people who are living lives that are shaped by and informed by untruths and unrealities. Mm -hmm. This, every one of the vignettes features at least one character who is fairly deeply enmeshed in some kind of wild conspiracy theory. And they're living lives that are de clearly deeply shaped by the, the paranoia, but also the thrill that they get from imagining that they have decoded the universe in a way that others don't understand. And there's something about Gary Johnson's shape-shifting that is thrilling as well. It's thrilling both to him and it's thrilling to the audience to see. He has decoded some kind of larger reality about the capacity to inhabit and then step out of different roles in, a way, in ways that are seamless and that appear to be highly persuasive to at least some people some of the time. Yeah, he's got kind of a cheat code of the universe, right? He's, he's figured it out and now he's now he's playing it on an easier mode or he's, you know, able to progress further in in the game, you know, and, and, and get what he wants. And and it's his facility with doing this gives him great power. Yeah. Right? Or yeah. at least in his own I mean it it does give him great power, right? He's put into a position where he's sort of catching crim would be criminals. But it also it's clear that it elevates him as a person, yeah. but he's getting an incredible thrill. Right, and, it's, and it's, it's quite a narcissistic movie mm -hmm. in that, from, from Gary's standpoint, you know, because the it's all based on deception, mm -hmm. you know, and he's not, there's a lot of roadkill <laughs> along the way, like all these people that he gets to, to say on tape that they want to kill people, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all shown then being arrested and mm -hmm. kind of put in court, and, and but... You never kind of follow their stories. I mean, aside from Madison, you never follow the the, the rest of their stories and see what that did mm -hmm. for their lives or how they reached some sort of resolution. Although I guess there is, isn't there the married couple or the, who do you know re repent of? I, I guess maybe yes. the, maybe this is unfair, but it is it is quite a dark. Yeah. It's a dark cheat code he's uncovered. It's not based on his finding of his true authentic self. Is is you know dishonestly arrived at, mm -hmm. or it's arrived at through kind of underworld. Means I'm not sure I'm quite expressing yeah. that sharply. And, and as you were as you were speaking, it it struck me that maybe we have misunderstood the characterization of Madison as mm. well. That where I was maybe inclined originally to think of it as a kind of an oversight, a lack of characterization, kind of a fault. It may well be that her sincerity, her utmost sincerity, is intended to set off against Gary's duplicitousness we are primed to imagine that she is going to be just as duplicitous and manipulative as he is. And in fact, it ends, she ends up being, as far as we can tell, quite sincere. Yeah. It's not clear that she ever lies. It seems like she's going to, right? It's, it's the whole thing, as we have talked about multiple times, is set up so that it seems like she's going to be this manipulative femme fatale character. Clearly, it seems like she's running a game. It turns out, as the movie tells us, she's not in any way. She is ends up being honest to a fault. She confesses her murders immediately mm -hmm. to, to Gary, a.k.a. Ron, in a way that is not in the least bit duplicitous, right? And so I wonder if if that's part of what's going on here, that there, there might be a certain way in which, she, I don't know if she's the hero, the kind of... So she has, she has more agency in your reading she, than we She has a lot more agency and about. I kind of sincerity and transparency that seems at odds with a great, certainly with Gary, but with a great many of Linklater's sort of iconic characters in this vein yeah. that we're talking about, right? That um, she is not playing a role. 
So Even though we, as audience members, we think she is. Yeah, yeah. So, so very early, fake. very early when she meets Gary, maybe in their first meeting, she, maybe it's the key line of the movie. Then in this reading, where, where she says, "What if this is like the best decision I ever made to meet you?" And, and it's the best decision because it's for me. Mm -hmm. It's something I've done for myself. So in in that reading, she's kind of getting out of an abusive marriage through her own uh, through her own efforts. She's successful in doing so, and she lands with a man who she, you know. She, who protects her, stands and up And she for chose her. for herself and, you know, yeah, maybe maybe that's, maybe we had Maddie all wrong in, in myth and in critique. She actually, she actually turns out to be the central agentic character of the whole thing. Which, which would then be interesting to consider against what appears to be the, one of the obvious themes of the movie, which is this, what appears to be the empowering character of being able to shapeshift. Yes. Um, because it is, we're told, in the end, it's this mixture of Gary and Ron who lead Gary to his best self. Yeah. Maybe what we distrust is the the rapidity with which Gary shapeshifts. You know, a lot, a lot of Linklater's movies are about identity formation over extremely long periods of time. I mean, Boyhood most right. famously, but... The but also the movies. before movies, you know, deliberately take place with huge gaps in time mm -hmm. um, between them. And what we find hard to take seriously or understand um, or, or take as sincere is the rapidity with which Gary, you know, cycles not, not through his variety of cartoonish hitman personas, but cycles between the, the poles of Gary and Ron and then finds the synthesis. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's very, it's very interesting. And it's, it makes me wonder if the movie is, if Linklater is being more intentional than maybe we gave him credit for. I think this is a very interesting question to, to, to consider in this in this section, um, th this movie does embody a lot of Linklaterian. Link I wonder what that word would be, Linklaterian yeah. themes, yeah. Um, which is, you know, as you said, the malleability of identity. I also thought, and, and you actually alluded to it, you know, the collapse between, of, of any sort of boundary between fantasy and, and real life. Mm -hmm. Linklater has said in an interview he gave to the New York Times about this movie that he uh, processes the world through art and particularly cinema. And he sees cinema in that sense as a, a sort of a form of real life or, or a way of living. Um, and that collapse between fiction and reality is something that, that shows up again and again. I think I was telling you off camera that when I rewatched the before movies, it really struck me how you can you can read those movies not as what they're often portrayed as as very realistic depictions of an actual relationship, mm -hmm. but as sort of fantasies that are taking place in Jesse and Celine's collective yeah. consciousness, or even as Jesse is a novelist and he writes about a fictional couple. You know, it would not be out of place to have the quarter of that movie be Jesse sat at a, mm -hmm. at a desk and he, he actually never met. Right. He's actually called Bob or Gary, yeah. and he's in the, and Jesse and Selena are, are fictional, and they're very strange movies when you watch them with an awareness of the fact that they they, they, they might actually all be fantasy. You know, they do take on a different hue. That you, the, the uh, it's usually read as well. This is the glow of love and how yeah. how the magic of romance and all the rest of it. And you could actually just read them as as complete fiction just, in in the heads of the the, the fictional character. Right. You know, second level. Yeah, sort of inception like, type yeah, scenario. Like a sixth sense kind of reveal. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um yeah, we should pitch that. Right? So, it's a, so think of the before movies, yeah. but one of them's already dead. What yeah. Like it's, it's like as, ghost. As done by M. Night Shyamalan. As done by yes. Yeah. <laughs> With Demi Ma <laughs> as the central character. <laughs> and we'll redo the whole the whole kind of uh, molding the the yeah. clear scene. Yeah. Um I think that's a winner. It will definitely get a lot of attention. Yeah. In the in the script writing circle, I think so too. I think so. It's going to be on the what is it called? Not the blacklist. What's the what's the one that's great scripts that are, that haven't been made yet? Is it green? Is it green list? But there's some sort of mythical, yeah. that, you know. And anyway, we're we're getting we're a bit off our depth. Yes, we're getting a bit off topic here. And um, I wanted to sort of end uh, with a question you, you just alluded to, which is the, the intentionality of Linklater um, in these move in this movie. Um, it's a crowd-pleasing movie in a way that's not not always, a, you know, it's not the first one Linklater's ever done. I mean, he directed, but crucially didn't write School of Rock, right. you know, which is the biggest, the biggest hit and perhaps the most straightforward or mainstream of his movies. But it, it would be, it is unusual for him to just do a fairly linear, <laughs> uh, sort of feel-good mm -hmm. type story. And I, I wonder if, it, if it's really just that on the surface. And one thing we can expose here in critique is, is whether Linklater is making a deeper and darker point 
about America, about mm -hmm. you know uh, capitalism and commodification of of things. And I, I was drawn to something Gary Johnson, the real Gary Johnson, said in the in the Skip Hans with Texas Monthly article. Um, so this is a quote. Bear with me. It's a you know paragraph or so uh, from Gary Johnson in Skip Hans with article the movie's based on. Except for one or two instances, the people I meet are not ex-cons, says Johnson. If ex-cons want somebody dead, they know what to do. My people have spent their lives living within the law. A lot of them have never even gotten a traffic ticket. Yet they've developed such a frustration with their place in the world that they think they have no other option but to eliminate whoever is causing their frustration. This is, I think, the crucial part. They are all looking for the quick fix, which has, which has become the American way. Today, people can pay to get their televisions fixed and their garbage picked up. So why can't they pay me, a hitman, to fix their lives? And that's very self-aware of, <laughs> of Gary Johnson, but the, that does then become a critique of American capitalism where everything is for sale. And especially in the fictionalized version of Gary Johnson who does actually commit murder. I mean, the, the, the real Gary Johnson never did and Linklater is absolutely clear we made up that, that part. The real Gary, or, the, or sorry, the fictionalized Gary Johnson does commit murder, does end up marrying one of his his clients, you know, and and is presented as achieving a great sort of resolution, a synthesis in his personality between Gary and Ron, great domestic happiness and and great sort of self actualization, but it's off the back of being the alpha predator or being a, you know, engaging in not only murder but a series of highly deceptive acts where his his great triumph is one of outsmarting other people, to, you know, playing other people for suckers mm -hmm. and, and winning, a, winning a rat race and becoming King Rat. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder if you put those things together, what the real Gary Johnson has said about the, the essentially commercial mm -hmm. nature of the, of the transaction and then what the movie is saying about how the fictional Gary Johnson ag ag achieves resolution. It's, it's presented as a happy ending, but it's actually a very dark critique of it's, it's a, how you succeed in contemporary America. Yeah, it's a dark ending. And it's also, it's the, it's the full embodiment and an achievement of the confidence man ethos. Yes. Right. This is, this is the ultimate goal yes. that Gary has done. He's both, he's both, as you say, integrated his, the different constituent parts of his identity but he's then – he's converted that, right, by, by being you – know, he's eliminated himself, the, the threats to his ego, right, yeah. in sort of psychoanalytic terms. And he's gotten the girl. Yeah. And the murders are the thing that bond them together, right? Yes. This is the thing that will ensure, as Madison says, you know, she doesn't believe in divorce. Well, this will ensure that that will never happen, right? They cannot get divorced. They cannot separate one another because they're bonded not by trauma, but by murder. Yeah. And this, I think you're right. This is, it's a very dark ending. The degree to which the murders are also the source of income, literally, right? For Madison, who gets the, the insurance policy, the life insurance policy, we're, we're led to believe, Um it is also it points to the commercial elements, right? This is the it's the ultimate con that has been successfully pulled off, and audiences are clearly intended. You know, it's the it's the happy ending of the rom com, but it's you know it's dark for sure. Yeah, I mean the the, the thing that was the comparator that was coming to mind when we were when you were talking just then was Blade Runner. I mean, this this is Blade Runner, right? Like, get, you know, Rick Deckard undergoes a journey of self-discovery. Um, his job is hired gun. He goes around and kills people. But is it really killing? Because it's all commodities, and they're not they're not really people anyway, you know. And um, and and through through this, he meets um, a femme fatale who actually turns who seems to be deceptive, but actually turns out to be very sincere. Mm -hmm. And they end up in a domesticated situation. Yeah. And like Blade Runner is the classic dystopia, the classic critique of American capitalism and the commodification of personhood, and yeah. and and the you know the 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 kind of unstable nature of of boundaries and realities and so forth. And there's a, I mean, maybe this is we're, we're way off into weird professor land, but actually I think if you watch that, those would be an interesting back-to-back -back yeah. <laughs> showing. Yeah. And you, you could ask maybe, Gary Johnson could ask his students, why do you analyze the themes in these two movies? <laughs> One of which weirdly features me, but hey, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, maybe this is Hitman 2, the plot of Hitman 2. The, yeah, I mean, all that is, it strikes me as, is very interesting and on point. And then I was also just remembering as you were talking that 
Okay, so for, so Maddie and 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 Ron collaborate on the murder, mm -hmm. but how is the the eventual murder actually accomplished? It's by putting a plastic grocery bag over his head, and so that that strikes me as it may not be intentional, but it's evocative, right? I mean, it's literally taking a piece of commerce, a marker of advanced capitalist states, the supermarket, mm -hmm. and. That is the mechanism according to which the murder is finished, the relationship is consecrated and bonded, and the ultimate con is achieved. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and when, when, when Gary does that, when he puts the bag over the head, she says, like, what is this or whatever? And he says, it's commitment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the, the shopping bag is like the wedding ring. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow, Th Jeff, this was really critique. This is when, you, <laughs> when people talk about critique... Get, 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 getting, uh, getting on those, uh, you know, is it a highway? Is it a back alley? Where does it go? No one knows. That, I think, is the essence of, of critique. We went deep. We did, we did go deep. And now we've got to, um, we've got to dig our way out um, and come back to the, the, the real world. Mm. Although, is it? Who can tell? Mm. But I think we should leave it there. On that bombshell. <laughs>